Welcome everybody to What's Up Wednesday. We're starting a little bit early, but that's okay. Early is on time, right, for us. So today's guest, uh, we're happy to uh, not only be able to feature Lucas Wormald, but also be featuring, you know, our top swimmers, our university athletes. And Lucas came to swim with me a few years ago, um, moved to uh, Oakville to live with his grandparents and train uh, with me at, at Oakville. Uh, came and swam briefly with us earlier in the year, went back to University of Waterloo, and now is back training with us and uh, kicking up a storm. So uh, I'm going to introduce Lucas. He can tell you a little bit of his background and um, his story, and then we'll uh, open it up for questions. Uh, so get your questions ready. Lucas, welcome. Take it away. Thanks, Sean. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? I can. Awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah, so uh, just to briefly introduce myself, uh, my name is Lucas. I'm currently in my third year uh, at the University of Waterloo studying uh, mechatronics engineering. Uh, and for those of you that don't know what it is, it's basically robotics or uh, automated systems. Um, so that sort of thing, kind of a wide range. So that's an aspect I really like. Um, in terms of my swimming career, um, I actually fell in love with the sport by doing a uh, summer swim camp type thing. Um, it was like a week and we got to go uh, and swim and race and it was a lot of fun. Uh, and this was when I was around eight years old. And then the following fall, I started training twice a week. Uh, and I, I, that's when I fell in love with the sport. And I really found I liked the aspect of racing uh, and always improving myself. Um, and it was something that I, I, um, I got a lot better at uh, relatively quickly. Um, I, I wasn't like the provincial superstar, um, but you know, when I was 11, I, I did make provincials and I do remember winning the 50 back when I was 11. Uh, and that, and that was pretty exciting. Um, I, I was a backstroker when I was younger. Um, and that pretty much continued, you know, when I was 10, I remember going to my first, uh, team champs when that was still a thing in Ottawa. Um, and, you know, just being with that team aspect felt so amazing. Um, and you know, same thing when I was 11 and 12, um, you know, that just continued and I loved, you know, relays and being like that, uh, first option for my club. Um, this was with uh, row, by the way, the regional Waterloo swim club in Waterloo. Um, and, and then, and then after I was 12, you know, um, things started to get a little bit tough because, um, you know, I, I noticed, and as I'm sure you guys have, um, you know, kids, kids started growing and getting a lot faster uh, and everyone was pulling off tons of time. Um, and, you know, I, I wasn't one of those kids. And when I was 12 years old, you know, I, I remember still, I was, uh, I went 235, 200 back at provincials uh, long course, which isn't a terrible time, but, you know, two years later when I was 14, I was still pretty much the same height and I was uh, uh, 232. So I improved three seconds over two years. And when you're 12 to 14, that's super, super tough. Uh, and I actually almost quit at that point. Um, and, you know, I remember talking to one of my coaches, telling him I wanted to quit. Um, and, you know, there was, it, was, it was hard, right, going from that, um, you know, the first option on the relays to being the last option to not being on the relay at all um, to, you know, kids telling me that, you know, I, I should quit and I was too small to be any good at the sport. Um, and a few coaches I had that didn't believe in me at the time. Um, and I remember specifically talking to one of my coaches, um, who I got to give credit to, uh, Matt Maines, uh, told me that, you know, if I quit, then I would just be proving them right. Um, and that's something that really, really stuck with me. And, you know, going into my first year of high school, I was five foot two and 90 pounds, um, so, you know, when most people say they've doubled their weight since high school, that's usually not a good thing. But for me, that's something I'm really <laughs> proud of. Um, and, you know, I, I have grown 14 inches since then, which also helps a lot. But at the same time, I, I learned some very key lessons there in terms of, um, you know, working hard and, you know, really finding the reward in that and not just um, – by I guess winning if that makes sense because I, I really had to fight you know when I was 14 I was a 232 200 IMer, and you know other kids my age were going 214 and you know I took that to a 221 the next year to a 214 the next year to a 211 uh, and that was my last year of um, was high school and so from there I had a decision to make because I, I just made my first senior national cut 
and I was looking at going to university and potentially swimming there. Um, but I wasn't really sure how serious I wanted to take the sport. I wasn't really sure if it was something that would be worth pursuing, worth putting time into. Um, and so I, I talked to a few different clubs about looking for a place to swim potentially for a fifth year. Um, and I remember meeting with Sean with my parents and I really liked what he had to say. And, you know, the club at the time had just won senior nationals. Um, and, you know, I thought like I walking away from the meeting, I thought that if I, if I joined Oakville and I really gave it a shot for a year, then I would be able to see, you know, if this was something worth pursuing, um, in the future. And so I ended up uh, living with my grandparents at the time. Um, and, you know, I can say that that was really worth it. Um, Sean's definitely been one of the most impactful coaches on my swimming career. Um, you know, he, he taught me like really how to race, how to believe in myself and what uh, preparation is. I, we had a great training group that year, I remember, and I made some really good friends uh, who I still talk to um, today and um, am still training with. So um, that's also been really exciting. And I, I really took that um, into university. Um, my, uh, even with uh, university applications, um, you know, I, I really wanted a coach that believed in me. Uh, and ending up at the University of Waterloo, actually, I, I believe I found a really good match with that in uh, my coach Jackie there. Um, she, she really helped me build off a lot of what Sean taught me. And that, you know, there's always a next level that you can reach and uh, never being satisfied with that. Um, I remember in one of my uh, 100 flies I raced, you know, uh, the goal was to go out as fast as I could. She said she wanted me the first 50 to be like 25.5, right? And so I did. I remember as soon as I finished the race, I, I asked someone what my time was. and She said 25.3. So I was like, wow, that's awesome. So then I go over to talk to her. First thing she says is you breathed off the wall. And like nothing about the time, nothing about I, I did it, good job, just that. And it really, really helps. Like, and, and that's every day I practice too. It's that until you break a world record, you're, you're not there yet. And there's always something you can do better. Um, and, you know, just I think having that attitude really helped me because, um, you know, I'm, I'm not there yet. And I still want to keep improving and pushing. And, you know, you never want to be satisfied with where you are because, you know, that's when you can stop pushing. Um, but yeah, no, like just bringing it back to, uh, where I am training now. I mean, Sean's given me the fantastic opportunity of, you know, still being able to train, um, you know, through all the COVID-19 spell. Um, and even though I, I had to go back to Waterloo for two months, um, I'm really happy to be training, uh, and Markham with the group I'm with now. Um, it's probably the fastest group I've ever trained with and, you know, we've been, we've been putting in a lot of work and it's been really rewarding to see uh, everyone's improvement uh, over the past uh, two weeks. We generally race about every two weeks. So that's been really rewarding to see everyone improving and pushing each other in practice. Um, and yeah, just trying to get better and uh, training for trials at the end of May. That's awesome, Lucas. So guys, uh, for some reason, your head coach here is messed up on the, uh, the Zoom time. It says we have seven minutes left. So what I'm going to do in, in about five minutes is um, stop. I'll restart it. Um, I'll send I'll put it on the team feed so we can give enough time for this. So trust me, another month or so, I'll have figured this out and do it right. So, um, so I'll kick it off with the with first question is, um, what can you tell us about what you're doing with your team uh, that you're leading at university and what are you guys working on? Um, you mean like as a swim team? No, you leading your team about the app. Oh, you mean my work? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, right now while being in school, um, I'm, I had a co-op last term with a company in California. Uh, they're called Athos. And they make sport, sports equipment, uh, like a smart shirt and shorts that you basically wear. And while you're doing a workout, it gives you a lot of like muscle feedback on like your contributions and balances. Really, really cool stuff. Um, and, you know, they've offered to continue working, like for me to work for them part time. Um, and so that's what I've been doing as well. Uh, and the, an app, I'm actually making a web app right now that basically tracks uh, dev environments. Um, so right now, right before you're sending um, like uh, code changes or um, like 
pro like formatting changes to uh, production, which is what the customers use, you test it in a dev envir uh, development environment first. Um, and so what I'm doing is I'm creating a, a simple web app that simply displays each environment, if they're up and running, uh, what the cost is, and uh, basically tracking if it's up or down or who's using it and the uh, version of each, uh, of each code base that's being used for each one. Uh, so that's just something small I'm working on right now. Uh, before that, I was working on optimizing and making the uh, product faster. Um, I'm, I'm trying to keep it high level, but uh, that's basically what uh, I'm doing right now. Cool. Okay. So, uh, five minutes to go. Um, what one thing do you do in the pool that you think most contributes to your success and what two things do you do outside the pool that help set you apart? Um, I, I would say that, and this is something I've been gotten a lot better at in university is, you know, not getting overwhelmed by the practice and really breaking, uh, learning how to break things down. Uh, you know, and I can speak to when I first went back to Oakville, you know, a lot of the sets Sean gave me initially, like, really overwhelmed me, because they would be like, you know, a lot longer and a lot harder than anything I used to do. And I would just remember thinking of like, we're doing 3100s best average. It's like, I've never done more than like four before. So I was getting overwhelmed at the 30. And like just thinking about that and it, my performance definitely hurt from that. So definitely learning how to either break things down, like whether you have to do it by round, by a single hundred, by each 50, like just learning how to take each one and not being afraid of failing. Um, I, I think that's probably the biggest thing that I've learned recently. And, you know, something that Sean really helped teach that, you know, failing with honor is, is, is better than holding out till the end and, and not failing at all. Um, and, and that's something that I've been, I think has really, really helped me. Um, Good answer. And, um, sorry. Um, and the two things, two things outside of the pool. Um, I think one thing I've been trying to get a lot better at is, uh, consistently sleeping. Um, you know, something with, um, you know, being in school and being in engineering, sometimes you're not always afforded the luxury of, um, going to bed when you want to always, but, you know, right now um, with our training schedule, I've uh, definitely been trying to prioritize sleep and I've been sleeping about an extra one to two hours every single night. And I've definitely noticed the difference showing up to practice that, you know, I'm not feeling, um, I'm not feeling sluggish or as tired as I used to. I, I, I'm still feel like I'm under a training load, but I, I still feel like I have more in me to give each practice. And uh, I'm definitely think I'm going to see that payoff. Awesome. I'm going to uh, just cut it there at uh, 2.37 to go, and then I will recalibrate. I'll send that out on the team feed and the WhatsApp to my guys, um, and we'll take it from there, okay? So you guys get your questions ready, and we'll do, uh, we'll do phase two of the interview. Okay. Bye for now. Um, yeah, for sure. All right. So... In the mess in the chat room, can you see the, can you see the chat room as well, or is it just me? Um, yes, I can. Okay, great. So while while we're waiting for another message, I've got one here. Uh, being a relative newcomer to the national scene, right? How do you feel you are set up for your runway into twenty twenty four? And what I mean by that—that's that, a great that, question. I know. Um, That's why I'm the head coach, man. So <laughs> the reason why I asked that is that you know you said in earlier that you know you were smaller, you developed later, you, you know you had to become a, a fighter and and learn how to train hard and withstand challenge and even sounds like you know some some bullying bullying maybe that uh, we see this a lot with guys is that. If, they're, if they've hung in the sport long enough, they've learned how to work, they've got their technique better, they're ferocious, they don't give up, and actually we find those athletes continue longer in the sport and actually go farther. So uh, the reason I ask that is that, you know, with your fresh experience at the national and, and CI level, that you're still kind of new on the scene and that you've got a lot of runway to build towards 2024. So how do you feel that works for you? 
Yeah, um, I, I think you're right in terms of improvement. Like I did grow later and I have seen every year I continue to make steady improvement. Um, and that's kind of how I, I take my training. Um, like obviously I am looking for 2024 as another like solid, I guess, uh, end point or um, checkpoint in my swimming career. But um, I, I really try to take things one year at a time and see how much better I can get like within that year. Um, and especially now with, um, you know, COVID that's even shorter, it's, you know, like, what can I do and how much can I get better by trials? And then from trials, okay, we, we did this now, like what's the next step and just continuously um, like looking for what's next. Um, however, and trying to get there as quickly as I can. Um, Cause I found that, you know, like sometimes when, you know, you make everything write down everything you're going to do on your to-do list and then you don't end up doing like pretty much any of it. And then, you know, you focus on two or three things and, you know, you knock those out of the park and then, wow, you got time. Maybe you can do a little bit more. Um, and, you know, that's kind of how I try to take that is that um, obviously I'm looking for 2024 as like a solid goal. Um, but, you know, right now it's what can I do like at this next at the next time trial I'm racing at? What can I do tomorrow in practice or, you know, like the set I'm doing right now? Um, so I think really trying to stay in the moment for that has been a really good um, like thing that I've tried to take on um, recently. But for 2024, I definitely think three years from now with, you know, some uh, continued, you know, uh, consistent training, um, you know, continuing to um, build some more strength, build some more muscle. Um, I think I'm done growing pretty much, but you never know. Um, you know, I, I, I am... I would say I'm very excited and interested to see where I can be uh, in, in two, three years time. For sure. I'm very excited. Next question. How does Lucas manage his time working school and swimming? Yeah. Um, uh, that's a good question. Uh, and it doesn't always work out the way you want to. Um, and there's definitely sacrifices I've had to make uh, with that. So I, I do try to plan out, um, my, my day, I do, uh, I try to get things done in the morning um, before I go to, I find after practice, generally things are a lot harder to get done, uh, especially in the afternoon, because you know, you're a lot more tired. So doing things in the morning that are harder, um, I find help a lot with that. Um, I, I, I did find that, you know, with school and with an engineering workload, I, I couldn't do, I, I did have to sacrifice a little bit on that end. Um, and, you know, I've, I've had this conversation with Sean, too, about, you know, school is something that will always be there, but, you know, your swimming necessarily won't be. Um, and, and, you know, that's something I did. I am not able to do as much work as some of the kids in my class, um, you know, in terms of like being able to study. Some kids in my class, all they do is study like on on weekends, they're reading textbooks and, you know, things like that. Um, but, and, you know, I'm not able to do all that or maybe participate in everything academically. Uh, but for me, you know, it's worth it because, you know, swimming is something I love and I really want to pursue. Uh, in terms of balancing my time, I, I really just uh, try to do the best I can. I try to learn as much as I can. Um, right now I'm taking um, uh, one less course than I normally would in my course load. Um, and that's because, you know, I'm working uh, about 10 hours a week right now in order to pay for where I'm living and being able to eat. Uh, and so for me, that's a worthwhile trade-off. Um, and, you know, while still being able to prioritize sleeping um, and, you know, doing all those other things right so I can hopefully have the best performance possible in May. I, I basically right now, because I'm prioritizing swimming, I, I take out all the time I need to to achieve that. And then I kind of work my way back. Um, so it's like, okay, I need to eat at this time. So it's like I have a block between I'm eating here and eating here. So, you know, let's see how much work I can get done here. Or it's like, oh, I'm planning to do, you know, like yoga or strength training here. Um, and, you know, I got to eat after that. So maybe try to do an hour of work then, um, you know, and just I try to work around, I'd say more work around my swimming schedule um, and just try to do as much as I can when I can. So follow up question with that, seeing as though the majority of people on the call in a normal situation, they'd be going to school, right? If they had morning practice, then they'd have school, then they'd either come home for a snack and then come to practice. How did you manage that environment when you were in grade, say, 11, 12? Um, yeah, like, I, I mean, just just being 
bluntly honest in high school, you know, I was able to get away with not doing a ton of the work necessarily that I maybe needed to, to get the grades that I did. Um, and, and, you know, like, so because of that, I was able to get away with missing a decent amount of school, uh, and time off for that. And I found that I was able to catch up in class, uh, for that. So, um, in terms of being after swim practice, like, um, you know, time management and studying was something I really had to learn in university uh, and something that was kind of sprung on me because, you know, I, I wasn't, you know, like, uh, right, right now I'm just trying to be the middle of the pack. Um, whereas in high school, that wasn't necessarily the case. Um, and, you know, that's something I've definitely had to learn because my study habits definitely weren't there in high school. And so for those of you guys in high school right now, I really, really encourage you that, you know, maybe if you don't even feel like you need to study um, to, you know, take, you know, either learn something new or take on a project or, um, you know, make those study habits now because uh, it's a lot harder to learn them in university. And it's definitely a wake up call for sure. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, people that are listening carefully and they hear the field that you're in, um, you, you have to have you have to have very good grades and you have to be a smart cookie to be able to even get in the door. And obviously Waterloo is one of the top schools for that too. So, I mean, without embarrassing you too much, you're obviously a brilliant young man. Um, and I thank you for your honesty about, you know, sometimes I didn't do that much studying, but I still got the grades. Right. Um, I'll just, knowing that it's kind of one of the lives where uh, maybe it's not so fair for people that really have to buckle down and, and be able to work for those grades and my answer to that would be that, you know, sometimes you got to stay up till midnight or 1230 and still show up for practice the next morning, right? And you got to do what it takes, right? So it kind of leads into this question here. Between those tough years of 12 to 14, 15 years old, what kept you motivated or kept you in the sport? Honestly, um, I, I would say, well, there's a bit of time from when I was 12 to 13 that I just thought I was going to grow and I didn't. Um, and then when I kind of finally like resigned myself to the fact that, you know, I was at a severe disadvantage to those kids, it, it, it basically kind of became like, a you know, uh, like proving them wrong type thing. Um, and, and 14 was like kind of when I got to the end of like that, like I was, when I got really, really close to quitting, cause you know, for the whole year, I was pretty much just focused on, you know, beating the kids that I was training with that worked so much harder than, and, you know, they were beating me in my best events and it was their off events. And, you know, it was, it was so frustrating. Um, but that frustration is honestly what I poured into my training and into my practices. And it was honestly the greatest stress relief for me in a way, because it's also like what, um, I guess it's also what's caused me to be frustrated, but it, it was also a great outlet. Uh, and it was something I recognized, you know, through high school and university if I had a, you know, a tough exam or a tough day in school and wasn't really understanding what was going on, I, I'd go to practice and I would come back and suddenly the world was a much happier place to be in. Um, and, you know, that's something that I, I recognized. And so I always tried to make, you know, going to practice a priority. And, you know, sometimes you just need to take a break uh, from things like that. And, you know, a, a problem I was struggling on or that I couldn't figure out, all of a sudden I was able to figure out after practice, after giving my mind a break from that. So, um, but in terms of being 12 to 14, I basically channeled, uh, I'd say all my like frustration and anger at the people and just kind of poured it into my swimming, like back into it. Um, and, you know, when I finally started to improve at 15 uh, and, and 16 again, I, I would say that was almost a harder adjustment period to get used to. Cause you know, I was 14 going 232, 200 IM to 16 going 214. I made my first age groups, you know, all of a sudden things were starting to change. And those guys that were, you know, uh, you know, picking on me or like, you know, all of a sudden they wanted to be my friends again. And that was, that was honestly really hard to deal with because I saw through it all now. And, you know, it, I, I made myself promise that, you know, any friends that I made, you know, in swimming from other clubs or whatever, that, you know, maybe didn't improve as much or, that, that I would always treat them the same because I knew exactly what it felt like to be that kid that got left behind. 
Uh, and I never really wanted anyone else to feel like that. So it, it really made me understand like from that point of view. Um, and you know, like, it, it's funny, one of the guys that, you know, was picking on me when I was 12 to 14 is on my university team right now. Uh, and we're actually like pretty close friends and we go out for lunch and talk sometimes about that. And, you know, it's just kind of cool to see like how, you know, uh, relationships and friendships can come out of those things as well. And, you know, being able to have an impact on, you know, people's lives and maybe say, Hey, like, you know, just cause someone's struggling or maybe doesn't swim the exact same time as you doesn't make them any less of a person. Uh, and you know, that's something that I think I really learned from that. Okay. Awesome answer. Um, how do you balance socializing and friends with being a committed athlete? Um, yeah, I mean, like, uh, friendships, friendships are obviously something that's, uh, important. And I think part of being, uh, having a healthy lifestyle. Um, I, I think for me in terms of friendships outside of swimming, um, I, I don't have a large, large group of friends that I spend, spend time with. I have a small group of friends that I talk to relatively consistently. Um, pretty much every Friday night I have a zoom call with them and we'll usually play a game like settlers of Catan or something like that, you know, just to like catch up and have fun and talk to each other. Uh, and I think that's really important is that, you know, it, it's not like always all about, you know, swim, train, swim, 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 24, seven, 24, seven. It's having really specific times of intense focus and then taking a break away from that and doing other things. And it's the same thing with school and, you know, just trying to find that balance and, you know, while I can't stay up necessarily till 2 to 3 a.m. to talk with my friends, doesn't mean that on, you know, Friday nights from like 8 to 9.30 that I can't play Settlers of Catan with them every week um, or, or something like that. So it's just, you know, trying to find, you know, like a shorter amount of time where, you know, I and I try to make that time very meaningful. You know, swimming does an amazing job at making your time outside of the pool and in the pool meaningful for like every single part of your life. Um, you know, the time I spend with my family, the time I'm doing school, the time I'm with my friends, uh, et cetera. You know, you try to make each part of that meaningful because you have a lot on your plate. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say. Uh, how, did you, how did you decide what program you wanted to take? Um, yeah, so uh, actually, well, I chose mechatronics engineering because it had the widest range um, of like the stuff that it taught. I wasn't sure if I was interested in going into the software com uh, computer side of it or the hardware side. Uh, and mechatronics is both, right? So like when you're building a robot, right, you got to build it and then you got to program it to do whatever it's going to do. Um, so that's an aspect of it that uh, really, that I really liked uh, being able to build things with my hands, but, you know, also be on a computer as well. Um, my, my first choice actually, and first school I wanted to go to was, uh, was MIT, but, uh, for, and they didn't have mechatronics, they had mechanical engineering. Uh, but unfortunately my SAT score was uh, half a percentage point too low. Uh, so I wasn't able to get in, but, uh, Waterloo, um, was definitely the next best option. Uh, and with their co-op program, that meant that I was able to, going to be able to pay for my uh, school degree. So that's something that I chose as well. What are some lessons you've learned through failure and success? Ooh. Um, greatest lesson I learned through failure is that probably it's, uh, it's not as bad as you think. Uh, that's something that I think that, you know, you really taught me, especially in training was that I, I, I still remember the first time I like failed in a set, like fully just like imploded, you know, my, my arms just didn't work anymore. And, you know, I, I remember I was like, I was kind of like smiling to myself because I was like kind of proud I did it. I was like, wow, like I just failed and like, I'm still here. And just kind of realizing that, you know, like made me like pretty happy because it's like, you know, like I did everything I could. And, you know, even though I didn't do it, you know, I'm going to get a chance to try again. Um, and, and failure is just that, right? You, it gives you more perspective, I think, than success sometimes because, you know, it gives you that ability on, you know, what you can do better. And at the same time, you're, you have that sense of pride about that, you know, I did everything I could and, you know, this is where I can be better next time. Um, in, in terms of success, I, I think uh, success Success, 
it teaches you about, I guess, not staying comfortable with where you are and that realizing, I would say there's always another level. Um, you know, like in my club in Waterloo, um, you know, near the end of my uh, high school term, you know, like grade 11 and 12, I was, you know, I was, I was the best swimmer there. Um, and, you know, everyone kind of thought I was this really, really good, amazing swimmer. And then I went to Oakville uh, and it was a completely different story. Not that I was a terrible swimmer or anything like that, but, you know, I was, I was training with guys who were at a higher level than I was and, you know, things like that. And just, I think success makes you realize and made me really want to reach the next peak, uh, if that makes sense. So, you know, you're, you're at, I was at regionals, right. And, you know, this was before I knew that provincial qualifiers couldn't even swim at regionals. And I still remember my first provincials and I was like, where, where did all these guys come from? Right. And cause I was just racing in the Western region, which isn't even as fast as the central one. And, you know, then you go to provincials and you, you realize there's an age group national level. And then, you know, you're at age groups and then you realize that there's a whole bunch of guys who could have been at age groups, but they're so fast. They're racing at seniors. So you got all those guys to chase after. And there's just next level after next level after next level. And for me, as I improved, it got really exciting to find that next level. And I love, I loved being able to set new goals. Um, and, you know, just seeing like how far I can go and, you know, still right now, like with your question about 2024, being excited to see where I can get by then and, you know, and just seeing how many, how much farther like up the ladder or up the mountain I can climb. Okay. Then uh, next question is time management aside, how do you manage stress that may arise from juggling school work and sport? Are there any specific techniques you turn to when things get overwhelming? Um, honestly, my answer to that would be swimming. Um, I know it sounds crazy, but when I'm stressed, I find nothing helps me more than, you know, exercising and especially swimming. Cause it's something like, cause it, cause a practice, right. You're so focused on what you're trying to do and accomplish that, you know, I, I was always able to tune out, you know, everything related to my life, whether it was family, friends, school, um, it, it didn't matter. And I could just find myself being able to focus on swimming. Uh, and it was almost like a relaxing break from that life aspect, uh, if that's necessarily weighing you down. Um, and I always found that super helpful. And that's kind of why I actually love the part that we get to swim every day is, you know, because if you ever have, if you're ever having a bad day, you know, you can just take your frustration or your anxiety out in the water and, you know, you leave feeling much better. So piggybacking on that, um, I heard some good news today. It's not official, but uh, there should be some good news coming down the pipe um, from the Minister of Sport. Um, we've got some encouraging things in the next couple of weeks um, for all of you on the call that are maybe not able to get in the water and do that sort of thing. So fingers crossed in the next few days, we should, uh, you know, hopefully hear some pr promising good news. And, uh, you know, it's a uh, little birdies are starting to say things are turning around, things are looking good. So keep, uh, keep optimistic and keep your nose to the grindstone. Um, what three things did you consider when you were looking at universities? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, first one, first one I'd say was I really wanted a coach that believed in me. Um, I wanted, I wanted to go to um, like a school like with a with a good uh, academic reputation, and I guess the third one would be um, a school that I could afford. Um, and and just going back to the coach that believed in me. You know, I, I met with some, you know, faster schools at the time. And, you know, I remember specifically um, OJI, like when I was training with you was my meet, you know, I took 10 seconds off my 400 IM and I think five or six seconds off my 200 IM. And I remember before the meet, I was talking to, um, you know, a few schools, um, you know, UBC was one example. And you know, like I'm not trying to throw UBC under the bus at all or say they're a bad team, but, you know, I, I talked to the coach and, you know, he, he didn't want anything to do with me. I had a five minute meeting 
<clears throat> with one of the assistant coaches. Um, and, and that was that. And after OJI, I, I get this email with, you know, this offer of scholarship money and a guaranteed place on the team. And the head coach wants to meet me and organized a meeting at U sports, like uh, two months later with like two other guys who are engineers on the team. And like, it, you know, I, I just, I, I didn't, I felt like my, perf it was more based on a time. Like my value was based on a time and what I could do for them than, you know, actually being able to like see, um, I guess potential or like where I potentially could be. Um, and, you know, I really wanted a coach, you know, like Sean that can do a good job at, I guess, believing in where you can go and helping, you know, guide and lead someone there. And I really felt like Jackie at Waterloo was a great coach for that. And, you know, so far I've been really, really happy with the choice I've made. Um, and, you know, while Waterloo isn't necessarily the swimming powerhouse that, you know, UBC is, you know, I've really made a very strong connection with uh, my coach there. Um, and, you know, I've really found ways to push myself and continue to improve. Fantastic. It just makes me think um, 2011, uh, when I was coaching Tara Van Bylen, and um, she had won two silvers at the FISU Games and had gone 226 long course tuner breaststroke, had this really good year. It was my first and only year coaching her. And I remember sitting with her parents and um, these U.S. college coaches that were coming in and, you know, they all have their, their cell, right, of uh, selling their schools. And they even said at that time that, you know, we think so highly of you and what you're doing that we're even willing to postpone your scholarship for one year if you want to stay home and train for the Olympics. And I thought that was a pretty big, cool, cool statement. And, you know, the other thing was that, Tara had gone through and um, she had seen a lot of these universities and, and in the end she, ch she chose UBC just by chance that it was the best fit for her, right? I had another young lady I worked with in, in Oakville that went to Cincinnati and Cincinnati pretty small school but it was the right fit for her and she came within a couple tenths of making the Olympic team in 2016, right? It was a huge, it was really good for her. Um, and I think that that's a real key thing is to make sure that you find what feels good for you. And, you know, when you go to your first kind of visitation, you come back from that school, wow, that was really cool. And this was really neat. Then you go to your next one, they go, well, that's kind of different and that's cool. And that's kind of neat. Then you go to the next one and you always have these experiences that, you know, you have to measure them up, but in the end, you got to find what really settles in with you that you're going to be happy there for four years and you feel that it's in your best interest and and those sort of things that's a that's a great great point right because maybe for for some people they need to be in that situation where it's a smaller pod more individual attention and other people's are pack other people are pack animals right they want to be in a big big team setting and that that works for them right so i think you really hit the nail on the on the head there uh, so don't have any other questions coming up. I'll just throw one more at you. Can you pick somebody in the group you're training with right now that inspires you and tell me how they do that? Um, well, I, I could pick pretty much everyone uh, from the group in a way that they inspire me. Um, but um, honestly, I, I have to go with Alex. Um, Alex inspires me a lot with the way that, you know, he, he approaches things. Uh, and, you know, he had a great, uh, amazing 400 free uh, last week. And, you know, just seeing his approach to, you know, before the race and the practice, like he's, he's very consistent uh, and, you know, super encouraging to me with what I'm doing. Um, and, you know, like how, just how he's been like attacking training, you know, if I've been there and, you know, like responding to me and, you know, uh, as I've gotten into better shape, I've been able to, you know, stay up with him a little bit more on some of the sets. Um, you know, um, I, I know you said one person, but, you know, Mabel as well, just with her consistency, um, you know, like she always, she always keeps me honest. Um, and, you know, something I've noticed, you know, in terms of like my effort, um, you know, like if I remember we were doing the three 800s um, warm down or it was kind of warm down on uh, 11 minutes and you know I, I I went like 
920 and I thought that was really good and she went under nine minutes um you know just like stuff like that where it's just like wow you know like there's always there's always someone else that uh I can chase or always always a way I can do better um and you know training with people like Mabel and Alex in that way you know it's just always another another level or another step that I can do to get better anyone else have any questions check the chat any, any other coaches want to ask a question? Any parents? Lucas, one thing, what, what would you say to, the, to our board of directors? What would you say to our board of directors right now? Things have changed tremendously in the last year. We've had a tremendous, you know, insurgence of, of talent and great examples and, you know, what they're doing as a board and as a club and specifically what they're doing for you guys right now. What would you like to say to them? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I would say one to get really excited um, about, you know, the talent that we've had coming in very quickly um, because, you know, like we've had so much change to the club in the past year um, and that like, you know, um, and also, you know, to keep, um, we can't really now because of COVID, but, um, you know, allowing younger swimmers the chance to be led and uh, talk to the older swimmers. Like, th I guess this is partly of an example of that, but, you know, just continuing to do these things where, you know, you can have an impact on um, the you know, younger swimmers and keep them in the sport. And um, I guess, I guess another one would be to like trust the leadership of the coaches and that, you know, that, and same for the, uh, encourage the parents to trust the coaches and believe that they have their kids' best interests at heart. Um, cause you know, there's, there's, there's always parents and coaches aren't always going to be on the line on every single issue. Um, and you know, I, you know, just, I would say encouraging, um, uh, the, the board to, you know, reassure the parents that, you know, the coaches are going to do its best for their swimmer and their development. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, that's what I would say. Awesome. Uh, oh, got a couple. What, uh, what healthy foods do you eat? Um, yeah. So actually living by myself now, I've actually had the, um, I, I've been able to, you know, start going to the grocery store, buying food for myself and, uh, making it. And, you know, that's, it took a little while to adjust at first. Cause I found that, you know, I couldn't just wing it. I'd have to, you know, make a plan for the meals I was trying to make. Um, and you know, one thing I actually proud of, I started doing is, um, I, I eat a salad now pretty much like every night for dinner. Um, I try to like, I don't necessarily like it. And I try to distract myself by like watching basketball highlights or something. So I just take like my like, salad bowl. <laughs> yeah. I take my salad bowl and I kind of eat it and just kind of try to distract myself. But, uh, you know, that's something I try to do pretty much every day. I can procrastinate a bit and, you know, it's like around snack time when I do it, but um, yeah, that's something I've been really trying to do is eat more vegetables. On days where you feel unmotivated or not the best, how do you approach practice in order to be successful? Um, I read a fantastic article on that uh, about, you know, focusing on um, one, like small things you can do better. Um, you know, like I, I, and I found sometimes that really helped is on the days where you're just not coming close to the times you want to go that, you know, you can still do the small things right. And you can still continue to build the muscle memory and those good habits. So, you know, maybe I'm not hitting the times I want on those fifties or hundreds, but you know, I can do, I can do one more dolphin kick off the wall than I normally could. And I can improve that aspect of my swimming, or I can make my turns a little bit faster. Uh, in terms of motivation, I find that sometimes the hardest part is getting to the point where you start and that, you know, you're, you're, you're lying in bed, maybe you're not feeling motivated after a hard day of class. Um, but, you know, just getting to the pool can sometimes be the hardest thing to do and then jumping in the pool and then actually get starting. Uh, and, you know, there's been so many times and I made a point to write this down. And I think that's why partially why, you know, you push for a logbook being important is that, you know, on the days where you're not feeling motivated, you know, you can write down, I wrote down before and after, and after when you see you're writing about how much better you felt, or, you know, you're proud of that you accomplished something, it, it definitely made my day a lot brighter than before. 
Um, and on the days where I didn't feel motivated, um, you know, you can look back on those days and use that as encouragement to yourself to help push you through the next one. Okay, great. Um, what, what do you think you'd say to parents in terms of how they can best support their children? Um, yeah, like I would say, you know, one thing I, I really liked that my mom did with me was that, you know, it was never about the time. In fact, you know, she had parents asking her all the time what my times were and she didn't know, um, you know, and I, I kind of loved that. Like she was never, she was never a coach to me. It, it was always after every swim meet and every race, it was, did you, did you go a best time? And, you know, were you happy with your swim? And no matter what, she was proud of me. And no matter what, I knew she loved me exactly the same, regardless of whether I won, whether I lost. She didn't care what place I came. You know, if I came dead last in a race, it was always, you know, how was your, like, did you go best time and were you happy with your swim? And I, I loved that aspect of it because it didn't matter um, how I performed because, you know, I, I wanted to perform for myself, but my mom nev and parents never put that pressure on me to perform. And I think that's really important for a kid is making them fall in love with the sport themselves. Um, and, you know, I remember when I was 11, my mom told me that, you know, like, we don't want to wake up at 530 to drive you to swim practice. So if this is something that you want to do, you're going to wake yourself up. And, you know, you're going to set your alarm and, you know, you're going to wake us up because I'm not, I'm not waking up at 530 to drive you a practice that you don't want to go to. And, you know, that really allowed me to, I guess, fall in love with it myself. And, you know, let, you know, maybe they secretly wished I found something else that I could do maybe <laughs> after school or not in the morning. Uh, and they were really happy when I got my G2 and I could finally drive to practice. But at the same time, that really helped me take ownership you know, I guess of the sport and my training. Cause you know, it was, it, it came from myself. It didn't, I didn't have that uh, on them. So I guess I'd encourage parents to tell their kids, you know, to wake themselves up for morning practice uh, and, you know, put it on them to learn that, you know, if this is something they really want to do, then it's worth waking up in the morning for not being woken up for. Well done. Well done. You know, that's part of the, the coaching process too, is to educate parents about, empowering athletes right that when athletes feel that it's theirs right uh, like I would refuse to carry Daniel's hockey bag into the hockey arena and all the other parents were you know even when he was seven or eight I was like no like you're you're gonna do that I think the bag weighed more than him but that didn't matter it made him tough but um, in, in the same line every time that I finished a race and I could see my parents in the stands and it was just like you know either you'll get them next time or uh, you know good job and love you. There was no talking about, you know, how come you didn't do a best time and, you know, you got to fix your recovery. And, you know, I think that as, as children, we never want to disappoint our parents. Right. I mean, we, we just don't. So, I mean, that doesn't even need to come into play. Right? It just needs to be support and probably more important when you're struggling than when you're doing well. Right. Yeah, no, exactly. And, and for me, you know, it was more about hard work and, you know, doing your best and putting your best foot forward. And, you know, my, my parents saw I was, I was doing that and, you know, that's honestly all they really, all they really wanted. Awesome. If there are any more questions, you've got two minutes to go before we're done. Um, this has been the longest one because we've done two. This is great. We got extra value today for the membership. So, I hope everybody's enjoying this. That's another 65, uh, 63 now um, participants. So uh, I hope we're really striking a chord with people and that you're finding this really, really valuable. Coach Glenn says, thank you. Nina says, thank you, right? And um, I think we're on a winning streak here. I think with this, this Wednesdays and Fridays um, are adding exceptional value to our membership. So thanks, Lucas, great job. Um, I'm going to throw a curveball at the membership, and next week I'm going to be interviewing a parent, a swimming parent that has experience from the learn to swim to the international arena, a board member, an official, a COVID frontline worker. So we'll be able to get a really, really valuable um, kind of input from a parental st uh, standpoint or viewpoint. 
So thanks everybody. Great, great Wednesday meeting. Take care, everybody. We'll see you Friday. Thanks, Lucas. Thanks, Sean. Bye.